Yeah, also before I start, um, yes, yeah, thanks to all of you for coming to see my presentation. I'm really delighted to be here in Taiwan. Yeah, and I have to say um, thanks again also to Professor Wink here for inviting me to Taiwan to do these guest lectures. Um, and so I did a lecture yesterday and this lecture today and then another one tomorrow. So I have really been honored to be here in Taiwan and um, yeah, I'm happy to for you, uh, to see you all here and I'm grateful that you come to see my presentation in, in such large numbers as well, which is really good. Um, I also would like um, to say that um, I arrived, well, just two days ago and uh, it's the first time um, for me to be in Taiwan and it has really been a great experience so far. Um, um, everyone has been really friendly to me and the hospitality is just amazing, so I just want to thank you are indirectly for this like, great experience I have uh, in Taiwan so far. Um, and I look forward to spend a few more days here um, and I'll leave in, uh, late on Saturday. Um, it's a short time but really a great trip so far. I um, also would like to quickly introduce my friend um, Welche, who is there, who I met uh, 10 years ago in Lincoln where we both did our um, PhD. And it was a really great coincidence when Dr. Welche invited me, I, I sent a message to Wei and he said, well, I'm actually living in the same city where you're going to, so we had to meet, so he's here as well. Uh, and yeah, I'm honored, honored that you're here as well, thanks again. Okay, so um, yeah, starting the talk. So um, there's a lot of stuff, or there are a lot of issues in the title already. Um, all its essay notes on nationalism, and I, um, Dr. Uh, Professor Wink here said that you are studying Orwell as a class here as well. Um, so I'm talking a bit about Orwell's essay notes on nationalism, but I'm going to link what Orwell said or things he said in the essay to some more contemporary issues that I have been researching as part of the book that um, Professor Vincure mentioned at the, in the beginning. So I suppose my the presentation will be about how the Western news media as an institution, the, the newspapers if you like, how they reported on different cases of, that relate to military um, violence, if you like, I'll explain that later. Um, and so it will be, I will, will reflect on some findings of a study I did looking at newspaper reporting and at the text of newspapers and how they reported certain issues. And I will link that back to Orwell's essay because Orwell is really interesting because in his, in, in his body of work he seems to, to say a lot of things that still today are important or relevant, if you like. So I want to highlight some of these issues that I, I, I suppose um, demonstrate how important Orwell's work is still today. And I do that by not talking so much about Orwell's text but by looking at newspaper coverage and I want to highlight something that I identified in news reporting and link that back to something that Orwell said and I hope this will become clearer to you uh, during the presentation. So it's not all about Orwell, there's a lot about my work I did looking at newspaper reporting. So I, one interest I have is to look at newspapers, like really um, say important newspapers in, in the West, uh, say in Germany, also in England and America, very prominent newspapers, the best newspapers that exist, if you like, and to see whether they are actually biased or slanted or whether they include propaganda in these newspapers and what kind of implications that could have. And I will talk about um, yeah, Western newspapers and how they reported on conflicts in, in the Middle East, so it's not necessarily a topic that is very close to the Asian context, but I think some of the, these things that are in the presentation, they might also be relevant for the context uh, in Asia. And I, I try to make some references there, but maybe you have some ideas later on as well to think about whether that's meaningful for you as well in a way. So I hope it's interesting also for you to get to know a bit more about Western newspapers. And I use the term Western, which can mean many things, just to, you know, to refer to America, Britain and the European German context. But I hope while I'm talking a bit about issues that are far away from here, so looking at Western context, I hope it's still interesting for you to think, well, how, what could we take uh, for us out of this, and also, of course, relating to Orwell. 
Um, yeah, just one thing, if you have, um, I think we have a discussion later on as well, but um, there's my email address here, and it will, be, uh, it will be shown at the end of the presentation again. So in, in England, we, we usually, as lecturers, we email also with students, and if there are questions, we are always happy to answer questions. So if I'm, after the presentation, say, if you have questions and you couldn't discuss them in the course here, uh, you feel free to email me, and I'll ha I'm happy to answer questions over email as well, in case something comes to mind later. So this is a bit of advertising for my book uh, that Dr. Winkier mentioned already. So I just had a book out, um, just last month, or in September actually, it was published. And this presentation is partly based on my book as well. So, um, uh, as mentioned in my book, I look at how the British, the German, and the US American newspapers, and I show you what that means later on more specifically, but I look at how they report on different um, incidents that involve what you might want to call human rights violations or violent incidents, if you like, uh, um, on an international dimension. And um, I want to see whether all these incidents that happened in different countries are reported in a similar way or in a different way and whether this might relate to political interests or national interests that are involved. And I explain this further later as well. So some of the cases I looked at is, are related to Iraq, the Iraq war of 2003, of which you might have heard, but also to more recent cases. And I'm not sure if you heard about the so-called Arab Spring. Did you hear about the Arab Spring or Arab Uprising? There was a revolutionary kind of uprising in, in Egypt, in Libya, and Syria in 2011, where um, the governments use violence against protesters. And I look at these cases as well in my book. And for today, I will just look at Libya and Egypt later on as two case studies um, that I use for my framework and also for the discussion on what Orwell said. And I think that relates nicely to that. Just, but I'll explain more later on that it becomes clear. But just so that you know, the presentation is based on my book and it's really new research I just finished, so it's, um, I haven't shown this to many audiences before as well. So, yeah, this is just in kind of an icebreaker or an introduction. This is um, a wood print by, an art, by a Dutch artist called M.C. Escher, who unfortunately who has already passed away. And I'm not sure if you can see this from back there, but um, the print is called Circle Limit and sometimes also referred to as Angels and Demons. And if you look at it, you can see the, that there are different shapes and colors. So the black one is a, the black color represents de devils. This is one, that is one. If you look more closely, you see these are all devils, but and the white one is angels. So I suppose, the, as you can see, the whole kind of structure is built or based on angels and demons. And depending on what you want to see, you see more the white structure, the angel, or the black structure, the devils. But um, you can try this out later, but if you look longer on it, you you might just see the devils because uh, they are, the white goes into the background. But on the other hand, if you look longer, you might just see the angels as well if you focus on the white structure. And I just want to use that as a kind of example that sometimes we look at something and it's not clear what it is. Is it the white thing or is it the black thing? Is it a positive or is it a negative? Is it an angel or is it a devil? And this kind of theme of two things in one is important for the presentation. I hope it will become clearer later on. Um, but I just like to use this kind of um, painting as a start because it's just interesting. 
And you might now still wonder what is this all about, but I hope it becomes clearer. And later on, you might, when you think of this picture, you might then also think of the presentation and see, ah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, but just to mention, angels and demons, sometimes that the same thing has two elements, and it's not always clear which one is the, um, the important one, and I hope it becomes clear what I mean later on. So, uh, Coming to Orwell, uh, um, to George Orwell's notes on nationalism, and uh, this is a longer quote from the um, from the essay, um, and I want to use this kind of as a starting point for the presentation um, because it's important. That there's a, there's a quite a lot of text here, so I just read that out out briefly. If one looks back over the past quarter of a century one finds that there was hardly a single year when atrocity stories were not being reported from some part of the world. And yet, in not one single case were these atrocities in Spain, Russia, China, Hungary, Mexico, Antriza, Smyrna, believed in and disapproved uh, of by the English intelligentsia as a whole. Whether such deeds were reprehensible or even whether they happened was always decided according to political election. The nationalist not only does not disapprove of atrocities committed by his own side, but he has a remarkable capacity for not even hearing about them. So what I want to, what I suppose Orwell wanted to say is that that was written in the 1940s, so a very long time ago. But what he wanted to say, I suppose, was that and on any given days, if you look at the world, there might have been terrible incidents that happened. This could be atrocities or crimes conducted by other governments or dictatorships or other uh, uh, in civil wars and so on. And back in Britain, where Orwell was based, these different incidents were taken in a different way, so to speak. So some of the atrocities that might have happened were were treated in a disapproving way and others in an approving way by the intelligent people in Britain, he might have said. And how that played out might have been related to, say, political convenience or national interests. And what all the, I suppose, wanted to say is that depending on, say, Britain's relationship with another country, a nationalist relationship, if you like, um, how, these, how certain atrocities were, dis, uh, were described or explained and so on uh, depended on the relationship that the British country had with another country. So, th so to give you maybe um, one, one hypothetical uh, example, um, when, when Britain was alive, when, you know that, and I'm from Germany, and you know that the Nazis in Germany in the Second World War did terrible crimes. Um, and I think some people might have said that at the beginning, when Germany started doing their crimes, they were still, they still had re political relationships with Western countries like Britain or the US. And some scholars might say that at the beginning, crime, the crimes that Germany did were not really discussed as crimes, while Germany was still an ally of Western countries. Only later on, um, when the World War got worse and when Western countries decided, well, we have to do something about this crazy country then, we have to destroy the Nazis, did they highlight the atrocities that not the Nazis did? So what you might say, what Owen might have said there is that, well, but even in the early phases, the Nazis did these crimes, but why didn't anyone say anything about them early on? Because there were political relationships there, if that makes sense. So I suppose what you want to say is sometimes, how we see other countries and what they do depends on our relationship with that country. And that's not always a good thing in a way, because you could argue that if you have a universalist standard, if another country like, say, Germany then engages in crimes, we should highlight that if we are allied with them or not, because it's, it's a bad thing, so to speak. And Orwell, I suppose, wanted to highlight that, in, especially then, um, in, in even intelligent intellectual people in Britain, 
they were not always objective about crimes that other countries did if, uh, if these countries were allied with Britain, if that makes sense. So uh, countries allied with Britain, where, where Britain had business relationships, for instance, or where the states were connected very closely, maybe uh, when these countries were engaged in human rights violations or atrocities, then the British intellectuals and the media and the journalists would not report as harshly about them as if countries were enemies of Britain and they were doing crimes, then the news media would have been maybe more critical about that. And I suppose that's something you could infer that that, that was something that Orwell might have wanted to highlight back then. And I guess the example with Germany is only one example, and I want to show you more examples of that later on. But certainly Orwell said that to be able to treat atrocities in a different way also depends on your kind of nationalist sentiments and as a, say, as an, as a scholar or as an um, uh, intellectual um, you might have had some connections with your country and that prevented you from being critical about your country uh, or uh, about the kind of relationships it had or had uh, with other countries. And I suppose always sees a problem there because, yeah, we shouldn't um, allow other countries to engage in, uh, say, atrocities or, or crimes just so because they are allied with us. I suppose that's maybe something he wanted to say uh, in notes on nationalism. We should always try to be objective about that. Um, and I will highlight this uh, to give you more uh, concrete examples later on, but I think these kind of notions are really interesting because they are still relevant today, and I want to show you why in the presentation. And I guess the, the picture I showed you before relates to that, the angels and the devil. So some countries' actions were, the, the countries were treated as devils, and other circumstances they were treated as angels, independent of what they did, if that makes sense. Um, so basically, um, adding to them, so how does that, my research relate to that? Um, so basically what I want to do is, um, using what Orwell said as a kind of example, I'm looking at news media reporting of human rights violations conducted by different countries in the world, and I want to see whether the news media reports on these human rights violations in a selective or objective way, if that makes sense. And um, often, Western countries have been engaged in interventions recently, military interventions, to prevent human rights violations, but I'll make the argument that this has been a very selective process and that relates to how Orwell saw this um, uh, early on and, and I think that's quite problematic in a way. And of course I know that you are lit you're, doing, you're studying literature and um, you're studying Orwell so my presentation later on will look at reporting in the in, in national newspapers which are regarded as a, I suppose, highest standard also in terms of their literacy and their writing and their quality. So I suppose there is also an interesting connection to studying literature in a way, although this is a bit more about politics as well. But before I look at, um, at the kind of newspapers, I want to give a bit more context about the political issues that are relevant for the presentation and the political context. So there's a concept called um, humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect doctrine, or, or called RTP, which is important to look at before I go into more details. So what do I mean by that? So if you look back in history, and that was after Orwell, in the last decades, um, Western governments like the US and the UK, but also the European Union and Germany, um, they did military interventions in other countries, so they used their military to, inter to go into another country with force, um, because they said, th these countries, they violate human rights, they do bad things, they conduct atrocities, if you like, we have to intervene there and to stop this, and they used the military to do that, in a way. And that's called, or that's what they called a uh, humanitarian intervention in quotation mark. Meaning, we use military force, but we want to be humanitarians, we want to be positive. And obviously, this sounds already a bit problematic. But they called this a humanitarian intervention. 
and there's, and there's a kind of international norm or convention which is called the responsibility to protect doctrine, which means that you might use diplomatic or other me measures and also military measures to stop human rights violations in another country. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. And again, you can see this relates to, again, to what Orwell said about human rights violations in a way. So, uh, something you might want to call um, shaming means that in, the, in newspapers then, if a certain country uh, engages in human rights violations, you see in a newspaper in Britain or the US that they shame that country. They write, say, there is Libya, they do bad things, they, do, they kill people, we have to do something to stop this. We have to engage diplomatically, but maybe even using our military to stop this country. And these discourses are sometimes featured in the news media, in the press, and you might want to call this shaming here. But there's some problem with the concept of humanitarian intervention. So nowadays, some scholars think, well, this is a positive concept because the underlying assumption is that, well, it's humanitarian, we use the military to do something good. But if you look back in history, this concept is not very positively um, connotated. For example, the Roman Empire, when they did intervention, you might call it intervention, when they used force um, against other tribes, they also said we had to do this, they had to do this to stop nasty things done by the tribes. And the question is whether this was always the case. Similarly, the Nazis in Germany, they also said when they invaded countries like, the, like um, the Czechoslovakia, for instance, that they had to do this to help poor Germans in Czechoslovakia. And this was used as a propaganda weapon to say we have good reasons to do some, use our military, but obviously it wasn't really a, a, a necessarily a positive intervention, if you like. And you can look at other countries like the Soviet Union who did the same, and maybe I'm not sure, exactly sure, but I suppose when China invaded Tibet, they might have had similar notions as well, although I haven't looked at that. So often, this concept can be abused by powerful countries to invade other countries. They might have nefarious reasons, but they would say, well, we are good forces, we want to do something good, but actually, maybe it's not so good. So this whole concept is already problematic if you look at the history. And then, um, uh, if you look at international law, the United Nations Charter, which is used to define how countries should interact together, there's no really, uh, the humanitarian intervention concept is not supported by international law as well. So it's the United Nations Charter, which is binding law for all countries um, who are part of the United Nations, specifies that you can only militarily intervene in another country if um, and you are acting in self-defense or if um, the United Nations Security Council um, approved that by way of a discussion and um, a, a, a ratifying an intervention. So a humanitarian intervention is not part of the United Nations Charter, so it's questionable if you look at the law. And then, of course, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. If we look at the history, humanitarian intervention has been applied in a very selective way, in a, in a way that Orwell described it as in, the, in the essay when he talked about how the intelligentsia speaks about human rights violations. Often, um, only certain countries have been targeted for humanitarian interventions. It's not a universal standard. So just to show you some examples here, um, these are different countries um, which conducted human rights violations in the last two decades. And um, you can see in, uh, in Kosovo, the um, Serbian forces did human rights violations in 1998-1999, leading to about 1,000 casualties. Then you have cases like Rwanda, Algeria, Afghanistan, Indonesia, and Colombia, where at the same time there were equally 
um, the military or the governments were engaged in human rights violations. In Iraq, uh, the American coalition conducted human rights violations on a large scale, where many people were killed. In Libya and Syria, the governments conducted human rights violations against protesters. Uh, same in Egypt. And in Gaza, Israel conducted human rights violations throughout three different raids in the Gaza Strip between 2008 and 2014. So what is interesting, you have a lot of different cases where different countries did human rights violations, but only in the red cases did in the, 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 in the West emerge a discourse about doing a humanitarian intervention to stop the human rights violations, if that makes sense. So in Kosovo, in Libya and in Syria, the news media in the US and UK and Germany and maybe in other countries as well, they included a discourse saying, well, there are some nasty things happening, we need to intervene there and stop the human rights violations. The most striking example is that if, if you look, say, at Indonesia, for example, that was a very close ally to the US and UK, they did similar human rights violations in 1999 in, in East Timor. And the US could have easily stopped that by way of using diplomacy. But they didn't do that because they have close business ties and other ties with Indonesia. But at the same time, the US and NATO intervened in Kosovo to allegedly stop human rights violations. And they called this a humanitarian intervention to stop the evil Serbs, what they said, from killing people in Kosovo. So you see that again, this is a bit like, that's why I want to show you the, the picture, the black and white angel. So you can see that we have three black angels here, Kosovo, Libya, and Syria. And the other ones, well, they could be black angels as well, but they were treated like white angels in a way. They weren't reprimanded for their human rights violations. But whether you saw them as black or white angels, didn't matter in terms of the facts, because in all cases you had relatively similar human rights violations, but only some countries were designated as black angels, if you like, as negative countries. And the argument is here, which I will make later on, that this related to some extent to how the West was, had a relationship with these countries, because Yugoslavia or the Serbs, Libya and Syria, they wanted to act independent of the West and the West didn't like that, whereas some of the other countries, that was not the case. And I, I'll show you the examples later. So, speaking about Orwell, he said, I think I have a quote from Orwell in the next slide, and, and no, and he said in Notes on Nationalism, all nationalists have the power of not seeing resemblances between similar sets of facts. So, yeah, isn't that what Orwell then said? We have similar sets, sets of facts, and they all resemble each other, but only in three cases did we say that's bad, if you like. So, so that links quite closely to Orwell. And she also said, actions are held to be good or bad, not on their own merits, but according to who does them, and there's almost no kind of outrage which does not change its moral color when it's committed by our side. And again, going back to the chart, our side was, for example, in Iraq, Indonesia, Egypt, Gaza. Our side did the atrocities. Our allies, Israel is our ally. Egypt is Western ally. Indonesia, Western ally. Afghanistan, Western ally. Colombia, Western ally. In Iraq, the US coalition, Western ally. They did the violations, nothing happened. And that is very closely, I think, what Orwell predicted already in notes on nationalism, that, yeah, to repeat it again, actions are held to be good or bad, not on their own merits, but according to who does them. If our ally does them, there's almost no kind of outrage. But if another country does it, then it is. So I suppose that's really interesting that Orwell said this in notes on nationalism in 1945, and later on, in the 1990s and 2000s, things happened in a quite similar way, and I found this really interesting. But to make this even clearer, I want to show you two more case studies to illustrate this on the basis of the press coverage that I looked at, how this really unfolds. Um, so what I did, and this, might, this is now a bit of a kind of 
um, a kind of a break. So this was a bit of context on Orwell and some of the things I mentioned in terms of um, uh, uh, how in the West we might frame certain incidents. And I now want to talk a bit about well, when, how does the news media re report then on these cases and why does this happen in, in a certain way. So this is a bit abstract. Um, if we look at the news media as an institution, and that's what I'm studying in my book, if you like, that news media, we mean, I mean in this case newspapers, quality newspapers, if you like, and you would expect them, if they report on human rights violations or atrocities, to be objective in, in a way, to treat them in a similar way. So what I showed you, these processes, in terms of how different human rights violations by different countries were kind of treated, you would expect the news media to not have a double standard like Orwell predicted, but to report all cases in a similar way, because news media is supposed to be objective, and we have other terminology like it should be accurate and balanced and should be truthful, if you like. And if the news media is truthful, it would report different cases in the same way if the human rights violations are similar, if that makes sense. So, now, if we look at research in the past, what researchers have found out about how the news media reports certain things, in the Western context, of course, we know that there are certain constraints imposed on the news media that might explain why the news media misrepresents certain events or even is biased in a certain way, maybe in the way that Orwell described it. So, in, in, in the Western context, we have a formally free news media which is not controlled by the government in any way. So it's an independent news media. But at the same time, um, the news media is highly commercialized and owned by very wealthy people. And it's big companies and corporations that own the news media. So if you look at research in the past, Many researchers have argued that this commercial commercialization of the news media also impacts on how the news media reports certain things. So we call this um, market and ownership of the news media and the funding by advertising. This might lead the news media to report on things in a certain particular way that is congruent with the interests of the owners and the funders, if you like. And these are two factors that might explain certain biases in the news. Then a third thing which is really important, that if you look, I'm, I'm sure it's the same in Taiwan, if you look at um, news reporting, it always includes a lot of quotations by other people, like government officials or human rights officials or non-governmental organizations or civilians. They are often quoted in the news media, right? And what they say, provides a certain perspective on an event. And we know in the Western context again that often the news looks at sources from the government. So while the news is independent, it very heavily relies on government officials to define events and what's going on. So again, if there is, say, a country engaged in human rights violations, what the news media often does, it, it goes to the government and asks them, what do you have to say about that? And then the, the, someone in the office of the, government, uh, of the government will say what they think or their perspective and then the news media reports it. And we know that often the news media quite uncritically transmits what officials say about an event. And this might then lead to an over-representation of the government position on an event. And that might partly explain why the news media often and focuses the same issues that governments tell them in a way. So if we go back to the list I showed you, um, when, um, when the, the Serbs did crimes in Kosovo and Yugoslavia in the 1990s, many government officials in the West said, These, the Serbs are criminals, they do nasty things, we have to do something to stop them. And the news media would transmit this discourse very prominently. Whereas when you looked at Indonesia, when they did a crackdown, say, in East Timor, Western government officials were silent about that. 
and then the news media would not have the ability to include quotations by the government on Indonesia that partly explained why they were silent on Indonesia. And while the press should probably not operate like that, many studies support the assumption that this happens because using sources from the government is really important. So I suppose this is a bit of a kind of theoretical background into how the Western news media works. There's much more to that, of course. I just want to show this to you by way of example. I could say much more about each of these factors, but I don't have so much time, so I, I go on. Um, but what you can say is that a discourse, meaning uh, everything that is reported in a newspaper or in the news media, you might have facts that span this kind of um, uh, bandwidth, if you like, but it's always a filtering process until when the news media reports an event which is narrowing down different perspectives. And these factors, I, I suppose, explain the process of narrowing down or filtering the available perspective. And the sourcing is a very important filter that often the news media filters in accord of the government official and what they say, even in the Western context. So if, if you think, and I heard from discussions here that we think in China, for example, it seems to be that the Chinese Communist, of, Communist Party officials, they control the press quite tightly, and they tell them what to say about events. Is that accurate, fairly? I mean, I heard that, right? And you think in the Western context that doesn't happen, but you see in studies that also in the Western context, government officials from Western governments, they also define the news discourse. Although this is a voluntary process, but studies show that roughly between 40 to 60 percent of all the quotations used in Western news media in, in international affairs come from government officials. It, it's not China, it's a different process, but the effect is quite the same. Governments can define news events, and that partly explains the bias, just so to be sure. So, yeah, in China, I guess it might be quite problematic what's going on there, but we have similar problems, although different reasons. So that was a bit of theory research. Now I want to show you two case studies to illustrate my points in a bit more detail and hopefully to make my point more clear as well. So I want to say a few things about the methodology I used. What did I actually do in my empirical study? And that's part of the book. So what I did is, and that also goes into the literary element, so to speak. So I had um, two cases, um, Egypt and Libya. And I'll say more about them later on and what they meant as well. And what I did is um, I looked at a range of newspapers and I looked at all everything they published on these two cases in a two-week period. And you might want to call this a quantitative and qualitative content analysis of all newspaper texts in a given period. Um, uh, the case, is, as mentioned, is in, in Benghazi and Cairo. Um, I, I say in more context later, but in both, so in Benghazi, the uh, Libyan military did a crackdown against protesters. In Cairo, the um, Egyptian security forces did a crackdown against protesters. I looked at two weeks of coverage after the crackdown. So two weeks after the crackdown, everything that um, a range of newspapers reported on these cases. Which newspapers do they look at? Um, it's called the National Elite Press, meaning in the United States, the New York Times and Washington Post, in the UK, the Guardian, Independent, the Times, Telegraph, and in Germany, the, the main national papers. So these newspapers are, so, so it's, it's the most comprehensive national newspapers we have. Um, they are supposed to be the quality press. They are supposed to, I suppose, be the press which has the largest resources to look at um, foreign policy events. And they are quite respected in, in the West. And the New York Times is supposed to be one of the leading, leading newspapers in the world. It has a large resources and so on. And usually they are called elite press because politicians, academics, intellectuals, they tend to read these papers. And there's a close relationship between Intellect, uh, the intellectual classes, intelligent, intelligentsia, and these newspapers, if you like. 
So that's kind of uh, the ones I looked at. And in total, I had 644 newspaper articles over a two week period. <clears throat> and I show you some examples of the findings in, in the presentation. And um, this is called a, a best case approach in a way that. Yeah, you can't look at everything. And some people might say, why did you not look at television, for example, or the internet? And there's the assumption that what these newspapers report on go is basically capturing the whole debate that you find in a society. Even though I'm not looking at television, you could argue that, say, a Brit American television will not say give you more facts than the New York Times, because this is supposed to be the leading agenda-setting news organization. Obviously, um, yeah, there, this is not always clear cut, but you could say these papers, they represent, broadly speaking, the, the most detailed information available, if you like. So just very briefly, and this is a bit technical. Um, yeah, you might want to know how did I look at the newspaper articles, because I had 640 newspaper articles, and there are thousand ways of uh, analyzing them by, by way of doing a textual analysis or a linguistic analysis, if you like. So, and I said I did content analysis. So, what did I do? So, I'm not sure if you can read this, but basically, I, I told you at the beginning, I'm looking at this so-called humanitarian intervention. So, if a country engages in human, human, human rights violations, how does the report, uh, the press reports on them? And I use the framework, which is from um, Edward Herman and Norm Chomsky, who looked at similar cases in the past, and they say, if human rights violations occur, you might find uh, statements of indignation or, or rage, outrage in the news. And these statements might instigate policy uh, relevant actions or might instigate simply um, sympathy or emotional sentiment or outrage in the literal sense of the term. So what I did is I had these two cases where, as I, as I said, two countries were engaged in human rights violations and I wanted to see if the newspapers actually produced indignant statements in response to the human rights violations and also um, to analyze what kind of policy reactions did the newspapers kind of report. And I clustered this in four categories. So if you have uh, human rights violations, the, news, the, the newspapers might report statements of outrage, meaning people say they're concerned about what's happening, they condemn what's happening, they mourn or they have opposition against what's happening. And this can be transported in the news. So I look for statements of outrage. Then on the next level, Newspapers might even say, well, this should be investigated. There's a human rights violation, we need to investigate it. So I looked into whether the newspapers prescribed investigations into the crimes that happened. On the third layer, I looked at sanctions. So you know that some countries are under sanctions, like North Korea, for example, at the moment. So if a, news, if a country engages in human rights violations, then other countries' policymaker might say, if you don't, we, we put you under sanctions until you stop your human rights violations, for example. So I looked whether there were sanctions discourses where you find the news media arguing for sanctions against the country to stop human rights violations. And on the highest level, I looked as to whether the, the news media said, well, we need to actually do more than that. We actually need to apply our military to stop human rights violations. And I called this military policy, so I looked again into the news reporting to find as to whether there were statements saying something like, we need to use our military to intervene in that country and stop the human rights violations. So these are the, basically the four categories that I try to find in the text of the newspapers, if that makes sense. And I did this on a quantitative way, so I basically counted the amount of articles that featured either of those categories. That's a quantitative aspect, counting that. And then I had a qualitative aspect where I pulled out example quotations to analyze them in more detail to see what they mean. And I show you some examples as well. And the main um, approach, I, I had these two cases and I wanted to see if these categories were applied in a similar way where both cases treated as black devils, if you like, or white devils, or were both cases treated in a different way, one as a black devil and one as a white angel, for example. 
And if Orwell is right, we had a black and white thing, depending on how our countries are related to the, both countries I looked at. And um, so, which comes, so the next, the final stage here is then to show you some, uh, give you some context about the countries. So, uh, I have, as I say, Libya and Egypt, I'll say a few things about each of them, and then I'll show you some examples of the findings. So, in Libya, in 2011, and this, in, in both cases, you know, there were the Arab uprisings where people um, wanted to have more political rights and more democracy, and they rose up against governments. Uh, and then governments re responded by force and tried to suppress these kind of uprisings. That's the broader context, if you like. So in Libya, um, you see some pictures from Benghazi. And one of the cities in Benghazi, um, an uprising emerged in 2011, and the, Lib the Libyan security forces uh, engaged in a crackdown during which about 227 people were killed in 2011 in Benghazi and in Libya, generally speaking, between 500 and 700 people were killed and these are the human rights violations I'm speaking of. So that was the one case and uh, the other case was in Cairo where also, as you know, um, the, there was the Arab uprising and uh, the, the um, President Mubarak was even um, even um, stepped down, and, and later on, in 2012, I think, um, a, a new government was elected by the, the Muslim Brotherhood, was the first democratically elected government in Egypt. But one year into um, its governance, in, uh, I think in July 2013, the military in Egypt made a coup and got rid of the government. And after that coup, the members of the party that was in government, the Muslim Brotherhood, they engaged in a, in a range of demonstrations which were then violently suppressed. So in July 2013, uh, on one day, 51 protesters were killed in Cairo by the military um, to, uh, in a crackdown. Uh, and that's, I suppose, the comparative case. So the numbers are a bit lower than here, but what we had here was a, a serial crackdown. So in the upcoming weeks, there were similar events like this, and, and, and hundreds of people were killed in, in Cairo as well. And overall, in, in, in the Arab uprising, more than 1,000 people were killed by the security forces in Egypt. So what my argument is that while the numbers are not exactly the same, the, pay, the cases are broadly comparable. So my argument is that when the Western news media reported on these cases, I would expect them to be relatively similar in how they treated the violence in the cases. But there's one political dimension to it. Egypt uh, has been the, one of the closest allies of the US and UK and the European Union over the last 50 years. It is, a, it is the um, second largest recipient of military aid uh, um, outside of NATO. Um, and so the Egyptian military is very closely related to um, um, American um, military, actually, and also to Western interests, whereas Libya, has been a far more independent country and has not been associated at all and was actually a country which was rather hostile to Western countries. So I want to see if this political dimension might have impacted impact on how the news media reported the cases in terms of black and white, making the claim that the violence in both cases was relatively similar. And in fact, I will later argue, and this might sound a bit shocking, that in, in Benghazi, the violence was actually on a, on a, was actually, there was not much violence actually in Benghazi as compared to Cairo. So just to give you a few examples, again, just a reminder to see black and white angel, is Egypt a black or white angel, is Libya the black or white angel, in, in the light of how the press reported. So I start, and this, I'm sorry, this is a bit data heavy, and I don't want to, it's a bit confusing, maybe, and I, can't, I don't have so much time to go through all that. But just very quickly, so you have the um, Bengal, Libya in this chart, and Cairo in this chart. And I only want to look at these two dimensions. So what is really interesting is that in Libya, and this is the different newspapers, New American newspapers, English ones, German ones, and, and, and for Libya, Cairo. What you could see is that in the case of Libya, 
newspapers, they, there was a lot of articles uh, transporting messages saying we would need to, there would need to be a military policy to stop Libya from doing a human rights violation. So you could see the numbers here, the amount of articles over a two-week period suggesting military intervention, whereas in Egypt there was zero articles. So this was out of the question in Egypt. And of course, I don't want to come across as being in favor of that, of course, but you could see, well, why, why was it on the agenda here, but not there? In both cases, we had similar human rights violations. In terms of sanctions, meaning um, a range of policy measures that are be below a military intervention, you had a relatively even distribution quantitatively. So in both cases, there was a discourse saying we need to do some sanctions, maybe or other measures, to stop the violence. But I'll show you in the examples in a minute that there were a very sharp qualitative differences there as well. Um, I, I don't go through the other categories because it's too much, but the first, I suppose, double standard I found is that a military, a humanitarian intervention was only on the agenda in Libya and not in Cairo. And of course, um, you could say, well, Cairo, I mean, this would be um, crazy to do a military intervention there because, I mean, this is a large country. I mean, who would do that? It's crazy. But Libya is a smaller country and it, ha it has not a very strong military, whereas Egypt has that. Um, maybe policymakers thought it would, it would not be as crazy, but from a, from a universalist perspective, you would say, well, if you look at what happened, they did an intervention in Libya later on and the country was destroyed and a lot of people died. So I think it was also, you could say, it's also questionable, of course, but certainly only on the agenda in Libya. So to give you some qualitative examples, I now look at Libya first and then at Cairo to show you some aspects of the press reporting and how it was worded. So, so what we could see are in, in Libya, um, a conflict erupted on 15 February, and already by 23 February, one week after the kind of crackdown, um, the news media would include calls for a military intervention. So you had Western policymakers and politicians to argue, we need to do an intervention there to stop human rights violations, or we need to um, prevent um, the air force of the Libyan government to, to be used against protesters, and they suggested that this would need some military support. And I'll show you some quotes to that effect in a minute. So after only one week, you had a very strong discourse about there needs to be a humanitarian intervention to stop human rights violations conducted by Libya. So this is just some quotes. This is how the media reported. So that's from the Guardian newspaper. Just an example. Nicolas Sarkozy, the French president, demanded a NATO impose no fly zone to prevent the use of that country's warplanes against populations. So it was argued that the Libyan government used its warplanes against the um, protesters. And Nicolas Sarkozy, the French president, said, well, we need to use NATO forces, military force, to actually stop the uh, military um, uh, of the Libyan regime uh, using airplanes against protesters. So this was an example of uh, a quote you could find in the reporting. And there were, there were literally dozens of similar quotes in other newspapers all over the reporting. So you can see some other examples. I don't want to read them all out, but this is from uh, Britain. The British Prime Minister David Cameron uh, had initiated preparations for a new fly zone, which would be designed to prevent attacks on Libyan people by the Gaddafi regime, mainly by his helicopter gunships. And in the US, it was the same. American officials discussed a no-fly zone over Libya to prevent Gaddafi's uh, military um, aircraft uh, against demonstrators, um, using the military aircraft against demonstrators. So, um, Gaddafi was the um, uh, um, president of Libya, or dictator in Libya, and allegedly he used military force against the protesters and a no-fly zone uh, was to be implemented, meaning the, the Western states wanted to implement a zone that disallowed the Libyan military from flying and using um, air force against protesters. And that discourse was very strongly um, found in the, in the reporting and actually, it was later enforced. So if, uh, in March, NATO used military force to intervene in Libya to do exactly that. Uh, but I, my argument is that the news media reporting prepared this. 
the news media basically advocated to use the military force in Libya. Then, uh, I skip a bit because I think I'm a bit unconscious of the time. Um, in terms of um, sanctions and other things, we saw a lot of other scenes in the newspapers. Um, so, for example, in the, um, the, the newspapers demanded that there should be sanctions against Libya until it stops human rights violations. The United Nations and human rights organizations should intervene to do something. Um, there should be a war crimes tribunal against the Libyan regime and all kinds of other matters. So again, um, there was a very strong argument in all over the press, quite similarly saying, well, we need to do something on different policy levels to stop the uh, regime of Libya to do human rights violations. Very strongly condemning the Libyan regime. Um, and you see some other examples here as well. Um, in the Washington Post, which is the largest American newspaper, it said that Gaddafi was, the uh, Libyan president Gaddafi was waging war against its own people and committed atrocities. And this constitutes not only lethal repression, but also crimes against humanity. And they, they might have said there should be an investigation and we need to do something. So just a further example of that. And there's more. I'll, I'll go over that in a minute. Um, then there was one other uh, interesting aspect, um, which I wanted to quickly look at because it relates to, I suppose, linguistic structures as well. So there was, uh, there was also the argument that the regime of the Libyan government used black mercenaries, meaning black people who were from other African nations and who they allegedly shipped into the country to do atrocities. And this is uh, part of the reporting in the German Süddeutsche Zeitung, they reported of killers who Libyan demonstrators described as blacks or foreigners and who possibly stemmed from different African countries like Chad and Niger and Sudan and they were regarded as ruthless killers who even hunt women and children. So there was really a strong discourse that there was really barbaric things going on which nobody could really stand and you should do something against them. What was interesting here on a li linguistic perspective, the article there had the headline Gaddafi's Sinister AIDS and in German, the word sinister has two meanings. It can mean sinister in the sense of having an evil mindset, but sinister can also mean being dark of color. So it kind of conflates black color with being evil. And if you read the article, which was about black Africans, it could, you could think, is this a bit racist in a way, saying that if you're black, you're also a bit evil, if that makes sense. So you had this discourse in the newspapers, in a way, demonizing black Africans who did nasty things for the government, and we as a West, as a good people, need to do something against them um, who did the bad things, and the, these blacks were part of that. And as I said, this led them lead to, led to an intervention. So what was then important that it later turned out that a lot of this what the media reported was actually not true. So um, in early March, uh, the American military, the high command, had said, well, we have no confirmation of any reports of aircraft controlled by Gaddafi that they fired on citizens. And um, um, despite of an intervention that happened, Later, there was a, a, an investigation by the British um, government and they found that the proposition that Gaddafi had ordered a massacre of civilians was not supported by evidence. The Gaddafi regime had retaken towns from the rebels without attacking civilians. The disparity between male and female casualties suggested that Gaddafi's forces targeted male combatants in the civil war did not indiscriminately attack civilians. So actually, this came all out later when already NATO had done an intervention and basically dismantled the regime. And actually the intervention killed about seven to ten times more people than had actually been killed before, allegedly. And I, I argue in my book that actually the news media produced a kind of um, biased report on these atrocities. It also turned out that there was no evidence whatsoever that black Africans had done any crimes. Amnesty International later, later reported they didn't find much evidence, and this was also made up. And one reason why the press reported in that way was, again, 
as you could see, much of the statements came from Western governments who had their own interests to intervene. A lot of the eyewitness evidence came from opposition groups and was not verified by journalists because most of the journalists were not present in Libya. So clearly Libya was a black devil in the, in the, in the, in the kind of reporting of the news media. So briefly, I want to look at Egypt, and I, uh, how much time? I think I don't have much time, right? It's, it's 36 now. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. So in Egypt, we had an evil, I can say at the beginning, Egypt was reported as a kind of white angel way. As mentioned, there was... In, in Egypt, despite the violence, there was no call for restraining the violence by means of, say, military policy. And, but there were calls on sanctions. And this is quite interesting. So, in, a, a, according to American law, um, if, a, if an allied country engages in a in a coup, and I said in, in Egypt there was, a military, there was a coup against the elected government by the military, then by law the US is not allowed to give any aid to that country. And the US gives about 1.5 million in foreign aid a year to the military. So there were some discussions in the media whether because of the government's and the military crackdown, the US should stop giving this money to the Egyptian regime. And that was part of a sanctions discourse. Um, and the same about the European Union, which gives about 500 million to the Egyptian regime. There was a discourse saying, well, shouldn't we suspend the aid to the Egyptian military until they stop the human rights violations? So, uh, to, in comparison, while in Libya there was a discourse, we need to use violence to stop human rights violations, in Egypt there was a discourse, we need to withdraw our financial support, uh, a more, like a more benign measure, if you like. And this was widely reported. These are examples from the Washington Post and Die Welt. And in many other newspapers, you saw discussions around this. Should we not, give, should we not support the military until it stops its kind of violence? And these are two examples. But it turned out that, um, um, well, that the Western governments decided, well, we, we, let's keep giving them the money away because it's our ally. So later on, you saw a statement like this, and the uh, then US uh, Obama administration's reaction was to call on maximum restraint of the military, but to announce that it was disinclined to suspend military aid. So Obama said, well, please stop the violence, but we will still give you the money that you get uh, annually from us. And the same was um, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, there were some other statements there as well, that. Where, um, where the Western countries said, well, while we don't like what the Egyptian military is doing, they are still important for us because the Egyptian regime is keeping our interests in terms of the Israeli peace treaty in line, uh, and also they help us with the Suez Channel and other things. So we don't like what they're doing, but we will not stop the aid. And then, and this is most, I suppose, striking, it turned even out that Western governments would support the Egyptian military. So um, the US had donated four fighter jets to the army, and, it was, and, and they actually said, well, we will give them to them. And then it turned out that other allies of the West, Saudi Arabia, the uh, Emirates, and Kuwait, were even giving 12 billion in aid to the Egyptian military. So this was right after the coup and after the crackdowns. Um, they even give aid to the military. So no repercussions. But what turned out, and this is really shocking, so you could argue that in the Egyptian case, there was not much done against the violence by the Egyptian regime, and even the aid was not suspended. So my argument is in my book, that the US and Germany and the European Union could have easily applied diplomatic pressure on Egypt to stop the human rights violations. Um, but they didn't do so, they just let them go ahead. And uh, it turned out, and it's really shocking, that a couple of months later, there was a massive crackdown um, killing about 800 protesters in Cairo uh, as that followed the study I looked at. And, and this was just a couple of weeks later. 
and far worse than what ever happened in, in Libya, you could say, but it had no repercussions uh, in a way in terms of Western countries doing anything about it, you could say, aside from rhetorical statements. Uh, and this was reported by Human Rights Watch, the, the human rights organization, saying that there was a massive crackdown following the earlier crackdowns, um, and that was well, well established, but Western governments closely allied with Egypt didn't do much about it. So my argument in the book is this is, Egypt was a white angel, they did similar things like Libya, maybe even worse things, but because Egypt is a really important partner of Western governments, for various reasons, they decided to be a bit more lenient about the human rights violations, to maybe condemn them in public, but then no, not much diplomatic repercussions uh, to prevent them doing anything, if you like. And I, I would then say, if we come back to Orwell, that this is exactly how, what Orwell said in Na Notes on Nationalism, that our, he referred to the British intelligence here, obviously, but our intellectuals and represented in the news discourse here don't care so much about human rights violations or atrocities by other countries if they are allied with us, uh, to paraphrase him very um, loosely, I, I, I suppose. Um, so you could argue that Egypt was a white angel and could simply do, do the crackdown, and they, they did this even, for, even until now, you have really nasty things going on there, and it's now four years later. Uh, I think tens of thousands of people in prisons in Egypt, um, the, the, the um, um, dictatorship re-established, all while this is a close ally to Western governments. And, and I suppose this case study, I, I guess, demonstrates in a way um, that Orwell's prediction is really relevant uh, in, a, in, a, in a natural context. Um, 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 and uh, if you look at these two cases, Libya and Cairo, they were quite similar, but the media reported them in completely different ways because of the political interest involved. So it shows that our media is not so objective as, it, as we might think it is, at least in the US, UK and German context. And I argue in my book that the political and nationalist interests of the Western countries determined their reporting of the atrocities, rather than the individual facts of the atrocities. As Orwell said in the quote at the beginning, um, um, there's an ideological component there. And one reason, as mentioned, is the sourcing that a lot of the discourse is very closely followed to what our politicians and governments said. So when the American government said in Egypt, we, need to sus we might need to suspend the aid, then this would be reported, but then when they said, okay, we stick to the aid, we give it to them, this was also reported, but the news media would not then independently investigate this further and maybe say, well, can, why don't you stop the aid, or there wasn't really a critical discourse independent of what the government said. And this is really striking because we assume in the West that we have this independent news media, it's not controlled by the government in a way, but still the government was able to define these discourses in, in a different way. And, and, and as I mentioned in Libya, uh, it later even turned out that much of the violence was probably exaggerated uh, as well. But the political interest was so high to intervene in Libya um, that this discourse was reproduced. So just on a final note, you might want to know why, was, why did the West intervene in Libya? And some people say um, Libya wanted to be establish um, an independent African Union, independent of the Western co consensus, and even an independent currency, and it also has the largest oil reserves in Africa. And that might explain partly why the intervention was seen as a, as a, as a suitable with national interests of Western countries. This might sound very bleak, but I think that's real politics. And I suppose it's an also an, an important example. I, I guess I'm, I'm not, I don't know much about the context here, but I could, and I could um, envision that, say, that power, other powerful countries might have similar rationales for doing their policies as well. And my argument is that whether this is a democracy or a more totalitarian regime is not always so different in terms of the foreign policy that they might engage with. Um, so I, I know that this was quite a lot of information. I hope that was fairly understandable because I had to cover a lot of ground in a very short time. 
So I understand that maybe something is not clear, so I would be happy if you have any questions or even if you're disagreeing with me or have critical comments, I would be happy to discuss them or if there are any further questions because I, I had to go through some material quite quickly, I would be happy to give you more context. But thanks for listening, I hope this was useful and somehow relatable to your context if you think about news media coverage. Thank you.